in um, October uh, 1831, uh, a series of riots broke out in English towns, triggered by the refusal of the House of Lords to pass a bill designed to extend the parliamentary franchise to some middle-class urban voters, erase rotten boroughs, and rebalance the distribution of seats in the Commons. The bill that in the following year would become better known as the Great Reform Act. The most serious of these riots were in industrial centres. Derby, where windows were broken, two prisons attacked, one of them successfully liberated. Nottingham, where more windows were broken than a silk mill, uh, and one, uh, uh, the three mansion houses, including the castle, pillaged and burned. Most seriously, and uh, best known, I think, probably uh, Bristol, where four prisons, the mayor's mansion house, 42 private houses, and the bishop's palace were all set on fire. Uh, and at the end, hundreds of men and women ruthlessly sabred and charged by military intervention. Uh, but it wasn't only industrial centers. There were riots in several rather less likely places too, um, though none of those uh, included arson. So let's just run through the other riot centres. That's Nottingham Castle on fire, by the way. So 8th of October, the first riot is in Derby, same day that the news arrives that the Lords have kicked out the bill. On the 9th, it's Nottingham. On the 10th, Loughborough and Mansfield. If anyone's interested in trying to work out why some places riot and others don't, this is a perfect project for you. <laughs> 15th of Blandford Forum. No one saw that one coming, right? <laughs> Not a, not a famous riot centre. Sherborne on the 19th of October. It's basically an adding in a public school. What's going on there? 20th of October, Yeovil. Well, that's near where I live. It's not surprising. Uh, 20th of October, 29th of October, Bristol. 30th, Bath and Newport. Uh, and the final one in Worcester um, on the 5th of November. Now, these riots need, of course, to be seen in some kind of wider context. Um, it's a bit of a fuzzy picture, but I think you can see what we've tried to do here is, uh, is uh, um, account for uh, every act, public act of protest that occurred between October and December, and December 1831 um, as a result of the Lords booting out the bill. This is just to show you that the geographical spread was enormous. There wasn't really a town in England that wasn't talking about this. It was absolutely the big news. So when you say, well, there weren't that many of that, why is it so important? Well, we've just got to look at those, those protest meetings that did turn into riots and differentiate them from the very, very many that did not. What we're looking at is a, is a mass uh, public conversation, if you like, um, which occasionally erupted into riot, um, or as we put here, disturbance. Uh, the... Uh, Oh, why isn't that working? Why aren't my slides moving? Oh, there we are. Um, we counted 494 um, acts of protest altogether in that period and then divided them up. When we say disturbance rather than riot, I mean, I know we could spend all day arguing about what a riot is. Right? Um, uh, so we've, we've sort of vaguely defined it here as where you've got at least 50 people uh, where there's significant intervention in their activity by the authorities rather than a, a sort of half-hearted uh, parading of troops, but a, a, an actual, some sort of interaction uh, and significant property damage to go with it. Although, of course, we can still debate what significance means. But anyway, you have to be a bit arbitrary in this. Um, so we've got um, 87 protests, which never became violent, mostly public meetings. Um, eight, uh, uh, sorry, 87% of them. 8% eight, eight of them uh, uh, we've categorized as disturbances and just 5%. Um, as riots. Now, surprisingly, uh, to me, little, very little scholarly work has been undertaken uh, on these riots. The first historians to tackle them were liberal advocates of reform themselves, early Victorians, really, chronicling the eventual passage of the Great Reform Act and chronicling it as uh, a victory for public opinion, uh, peaceful pressure from without, and regardless of whether or not the October riots contributed in any way to the winning of the act, 
disorder was swiftly reduced to a footnote uh, in most of these accounts. And the crowd pathologized, I think is the best way to put it, as a disinterested criminal underclass. The failure of the old aristocratic order to contain working class rioters, it was implied, and the reluctance of respectable disaffected townsmen in most of those riot centers to come to the aid of a discredited out of date civil power was evidence enough, it was argued, of the need for reform. And for the offices of state to pass into the able hands of the middle class. For as the radical utilitarian soon to be MP for Bath, John Arthur Roebuck put it in his own uh, history of the bill, uh, the, 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 it's a two volume uh, uh, account of Gray's Whig ministry from 1830, Roebuck has this to say, peace and order, he says, are in England preserved by the middle class. The mere fact of their withholding their aid would at any time hand over the country as a prey to be disputed by the soldiers on the one side and the turbulent and uneducated and criminal portion of the mob on the other. Riot and confusion necessarily follow whensoever the middle class manifests this most dangerous apathy. Rioting had been fiercer in Bristol than elsewhere, according to Roebuck, because this most, this, this most dangerous apathy, as he put it, was more acute there than anywhere else. And consequently, in Bristol, the fierce spirit of that turbulent mass of crime and misery lying at the bottom of all large communities, once excited and let loose, could not be restrained within the bounds of prudence and order. They took advantage of the license thus unwarily afforded them and sought to satisfy their hate and their cupidity by plunder and devastation. Well, plenty of other chroniclers chimed in, unsurprisingly, perhaps the most dismissive was Henry Jefferson, whose two volume history uh, of the platform, its rise and progress published in 1892, a history which spun a progressive uh, and, and rational narrative of reform from its 18th century origins um, to the present day, uh, drew a sharp distinction in the process between the people on the one hand and the crowd on the other. Uh, here's Jefferson, in every society, and particularly in a large city, there is a substratum of criminal or needy men ever ready to avail themselves of any opportunity for plunder and disturbance. The opportunity came with the helpless incapacity of the authorities, for no effectual means had been taken either to prevent or put down a riot, and the criminal and reckless classes availed themselves of the neglect. No other explanation is needed. The idea of the crowd as a point of convergence for an, an imagined criminal class wasn't new um, at all, um, but um, let's say, for example, in 1831 uh, itself, the Bristol Gazette newspaper had no doubt that the political crisis over the fate of the bill had been seized on by those who did the mischief as an opportunity for committing crime. For we are prepared to show that those who were the practical rioters and incendiaries were not what are generally called the townspeople, but a class of miscreants who neither care nor cared anything about reform. In Jefferson's day, these ideas were of course being amplified and made intellectually respectable by early social psychologists like Gustave Le Bon, whose best known book, The Crowd, of course was published in uh, 1895. There he is. Uh, uh, in crowds, he argued, people lose all sense of independent reason. An act of submergence uh, is the, the term used by Le Bon. They surrender the rational self to the group. And in such a state, they feel easy prey to contagion, the imperative of the mass to follow the loudest voice, which sooner or later belongs to a brutalized criminal class brought together by a process called convergence. That is, bad company attracts bad company. 
the liberal historians of the early 20th century, name any of them, but Halevi, Trevelyan, J.R.M. Butler, and others were equally nonplussed by the reform riots. Didn't know quite what to say about them, often didn't say anything much at all. Butler's great monograph on the reform bill uh, uh, relegated even the Bristol and Nottingham riots, the two most fierce uh, of them, to a few short sentences. Unrest, he said, produced by a rabble, which in the frenzy of the moment had forgotten whatever little it ever knew about reform. While later historians of the crowd, especially those emerging from the new left and the new social history, people with whom we are probably more familiar, obviously rejected the Le Bon thesis, or at least refined it. Um, and they've perhaps been most comfortable, though, um, discussing riots in which some sort of legitimizing notion can easily be located, some kind of moral economy can easily be located, because it can be brought into play as evidence of the reasoned and justified behavior of the crowd. Uh, it makes it a, you know, an, e an easier topic uh, for historians to feel sympathy with, I guess. Um, uh, we have arguably, through that process, rehabilitated the crowd as a serious subject with whom we can feel some kind of historical uh, empathy or sympathy, but not without imposing certain polite behavioural constraints upon the way that it behaves. E.P. Thompson noted only disappointing and anachronistic echoes of the priestly and Gordon riots in the uprisings of 1831. I think he didn't really know what to say about them either, but he sum summarized them briefly. In these terms, <clears throat> the democratic sentiments informing the rioters should not mislead us into mistaking the Bristol riots for a politically conscious revolutionary action. Bristol in 1831 exemplifies the persistence of older, backward looking patterns of behavior, just as much as Manchester in 1819 exemplifies the emergence of the self-disciplined patterns of the new working class movement. And it's pretty obvious you can see there in the language here which, where, where his sympathies lie and what he thinks is the more progressive uh, way of thinking uh, about um, historical developments. And clearly, as Thompson was perfectly aware, there was no coordinated plan of insurrection in 1831. I'd look foolish sitting here and trying to persuade you that there was, but concentration on the destructive criminality uh, of the crowd has rather left the impression that the rioters shouldn't be regarded as politically motivated. Uh, that the vocal cry of reform, the music accompanying every action they made was somehow made in ignorance of its meaning. Or along lines already rehearsed actually by, uh, by Peter Jones in relation to swing in 1830. I'm quoting Peter here. Um, but you, it, it's it, it's it's a, an analysis you could, I think, probably uh, saddle the 1831 rioters with uh, a series of events tangentially connected in terms of their concerns, but having no guiding principle or special or special end outside the localities in which they occurred. Yeah, it fits, I guess, but uh, we should be careful not to completely disregard the agency of the men and women who made up the crowd. Because as Thompson also reminded us, and it's never, it's, it's, it's always worth remembering this bit, they lived through these times of acute social disturbance and we did not. There were inevitably local factors as well as national political issues behind many of these riots and reasons why some communities rioted while others didn't. Bristol's experience was extraordinary, for example, because this was a city that did not riot uh, uh, when the Lords rejected the bill on the 8th of October. Derby did, Bristol didn't. But three weeks later, and triggered then by a local event, by the city recorder, Sir Charles Wetherill, one of the most notorious and outspoken opponents of reform in the country, was ceremonially, ceremoniously to be processed through the streets of the city against all sensible advice to preside over the October assize. Local factors aside, we might take an interest in some of the things these riots did each have in common. Let's have a look. Well, we can say, looking at all of them, 
sum summary, property was targeted, but property was not targeted randomly. Typically, it's the windows of well-known local opponents of reform. The windows are singled out for the first, first punishment. In some protests, buildings were entered as well. Furniture, papers, other items might be destroyed, but looting was rare. So we would not say these are acquisitive riots, they are more expressive riots. Physical conflict was very minimal. Well, that's, of course, we know anyone studied rioting in the 18th century you know, and Bristol, uh, you know, British mobs tend uh, not to, to use physical violence against their opponents unless, uh, unless uh, attacked. And that's the case here, too. Physical conflict was minimal, generally reserved for intervening constables, soldiers and magistrates where it happened at all. But civilian anti-reformers, the, the, the ideological enemy, uh, were not generally assaulted. Although some of the rioters did indeed have criminal records as charged, well, they were not necessarily representative of the crowd. The point about this is <laughs> those with previous convictions were usually the most easily recognized by the magistrates who came to oppose the crowd or by the constables. And so the most likely to be arrested and charged and so the most the, the best known to, to us um, here now. And despite all the pathologizing about a criminal class, contemporaries also said one or two things that might surprise us, and perhaps it's worth listening to them. Here's William Nassau Molesworth. I don't know if you've read him, but he was the Reform Bill's first historian, wrote a, an account of the passing of the bill in 1856. And here he is talking about the crowd's fire raising at Bristol in Queen Square on the second night. They went about their work in a very systematic and business-like manner, giving the inmates of each house half an hour's notice before firing it, which is extraordinarily reasonable of them, but there is a kind of a, this, this is not a kind of an out of control force of nature. And then again, it should be mentioned in justice to the Bristol rioters, Notwithstanding all the drunkenness and excited passions that prevailed, no act of personal violence or brutality to any individual could be laid to their charge. So although the Bristol riots culminated in arson, looting and a bloody dispersal by regular dragoons, they began with protests against a single target, Sir Charles Wetherill, the breaking of the windows of the mayor's mansion house in which Wetherill had taken refuge. And bar some vicious fighting with constables set it, sent in to arrest them, that was basically the extent of the action on the first day. Virtually every major point of escalation that followed, and of course there were many, can be shown to have come about in response to injudicious interventions on the part of the civil and military authorities. But leaving Bristol aside as a relatively well-known disturbance, I don't want to look at it in great detail here, we might want to go and look for, well, we will go and look for the common features I've just been listing uh, in a single, less familiar riot. Sherbourne Abbey in public school, uh, but also, I mean, it's not less, it's, it's, there's rather more to it. 18th to 19th of October, 1831. Some of you might not be familiar with Sherbourne, so I can tell you it's in Dorset. There it is. Um, a rural idyll in some ways. Um, and as usual, there's a local context to the riot at Sherborne. Uh, in the midst of the, the furore over the vote in the House of Lords, a hard-fought by-election was taking place for one of the county seats in Dorset. The contest between a Whig reform candidate and a Tory anti-reform candidate, Lord Ashley, was terminated on the 15th of October with a win by just 36 votes for the anti-reformer Lord Ashley. Reformers were convinced that Ashley only won by hiring lawyers to corruptly disqualify large numbers of Whig voters. And there had been scuffles with the yeomanry on that account uh, on the voting field at Dorchester as a consequence. Blandford Forum, not far down the road from there, uh, broke out into rioting the same night that the election result was given. Sherborne didn't riot that night, but it did riot three days later, 
But what happened three days, oh no, sorry, well, <laughs> four days later. What happens three days later uh, was a public meeting was held at the town hall to protest the election result. Um, the town hall is there. And a day following that public meeting, the 19th of October, the town's chief magistrate, the Reverend John Parsons, fearing possible trouble that evening, closed down the annual Pac Monday Fair a day or two early. This meant something to people in Sherbourne, it may not mean very much to you. But he was an unpopular fellow and it didn't make him any more popular for doing so. And this in turn therefore inspired a street protest <clears throat> led by three men equipped with a drum, a fife and a small flag. As one local paper put it, they came and cried, reform! And a cry was then made for smashing some windows of anti-reformers. Well, a crowd of two to 400 people gathered outside the town hall and then set off on a clockwise circumnavigation of the town. To further cries of reform, raking the windows of known voters for Lord Ashley and his supporters and his election committee as they went. Each red dot on the map there represents one <laughs> selected target. So, and they're listed on the side, I don't need to go through who they all were, but they, we've checked them and they were all voters for Lord Ashley and the crowd knew who they had selected. So in sequence, these included um, this man, Thomas Fuchs, chair of Ashley's election committee, agent to Lord Digby, the mayor, the, the uh, Lord of the Manor, uh, lived at Sherbourne Castle, the bottom of the map there, um, voted himself as a Lord, voted against the bill uh, in the House of Lords on the, uh, uh, on the 8th. They attacked the house of another clerical MP, Edward West, over there. Um, and then a lengthy detour they took down to Lord Digby's castle, where, so it was reported, they broke 365 windows. I don't know why, who was counting. Well, basically, I think it was Lord Digby who was counting, and these were the, this was the number of breakages he tried to claim for later. One window for every day of the year. Uh, it was a furious and concerted attack on the Lord of the Manor, and it only ended when one of his mates stuck a gun out of the window and fired it into the air and the mob moved on. They continued to gather to the tour around the main streets and the Reverend Parsons, who closed down the Pack Monday Fair, and two gentlemen who were with him intervened just here and tried to disperse the crowd. There was then an altercation. Parsons tried to seize some of the people in the crowd, but they rounded on him. The prisoners were rescued quite easily and Parsons was forced to retreat with a wound to his head. The crowd then made two more attacks on offending Tory windows and then ended the night with a much more serious attack on Parsons' vicarage out there. Parsons' vicarage didn't just have its windows broken, they entered it, they wrecked it, they smashed his furniture, they pulled food and drink out onto the front lawn and they partied way into the night upon it. At three o'clock in the morning, Parsons himself and Lord Digby got together and wrote a panicking letter to Lord Melbourne, the Home Secretary, requesting troops fast and ordered the North Dorset County Yeomanry to muster in the meantime. Everybody goes to sleep the following morning. John Parsons, furious that nobody had come out to assist him the previous evening. These are the, the middle classes who won't come out and help that Roebuck was talking about earlier. Parsons toured the town, castigating middle class reformers for standing by and encouraging riots. He then called a town hall meeting to enrol special constables pronto, <laughs> but the insulted reformers stood aloof and the anti-reformers were too afraid of reprisals to turn out themselves. So a grand total of 12 special constables were sworn in after all that shattering of glass the night before. A year earlier, during the swing disturbances, 700 people had volunteered uh, at Sherbourne to become special constables. So 
clearly the mood has changed. Parsons now appealed to the yeomanry. Their commanding officer, Colonel Gooden, was far from enthusiastic about being called upon. He felt that their appearance would only cause, quote, more irritation and excite angry feelings, which it must be the object of every person of both parties to suppress. Regulars would be a much better option, he suggested. But of course, <laughs> Parsons knew that perfectly well. There just wasn't any likelihood of the dragoons who they requested arriving at Sherborne before the evening fell. So, Gooden managed to raise 20 men. He mustered them at the town hall, number one on the map. Yeah, we've seen that earlier. They've just sort of zoomed in on the central streets. And what happened, if you just follow the arrows and the numbers, what happened is that um, Parsons rushed out to meet the crowd. The crowd assembled at where it says point two there, little circle with a two on it, the top of Cheap Street, and resumed their attack on Fuchs's house, which they'd started the night before. Chief Magistrate Parsons rushed over there and, start, and read the riot act, first time it had been read, but the crowd pelted him and he was forced to retreat. He hadn't taken the soldiers with him, obviously he hadn't, he hadn't thought of it, so the, the soldiers, hearing the commotion at the top of Cheap Street, uh, formed up on their horses and charged up the street um, in order to engage with the crowd, to charge them, to effect a dispersal. But the crowd stood their ground. They threw stones and missiles from behind doors and passages, we were told by a, a local newspaper report. They stood behind walls where it was impossible for cavalry to act or get at the assailants. Um, point three on the map, I think that is. Since he hadn't heard the riot act read and there was no magistrate now present, Gooden declared, sorry, Gooden dared not order the use of sabres or firearms, so he retreated and took his men round in a circuit. So if you, from point two down to point three, he galloped back and then round the side up to point four and round in order to try to attack, the, take the crowd from behind. Great military manoeuvre. Mm -hmm. All that happened by doing that was that he made the fighting more intense. The crowd stood firm once again. Two horses were brought down, swords and hats were captured. One soldier was pulled from his horse, pushed against a wall and beaten with sticks. And two further failed charges. He didn't give up, but two further failed charges left eight of the yeomanry of the 20 men he'd originally mustered badly wounded. Gooden retreated his men back down to the town hall, pursued by stone throwers. Only when he made a show of distributing live ball to his men did some members of the crowd agree to pass. And finally, at about midnight, they agreed to go home. Later that night, 38 dragoons arrived. The trouble was therefore effectively over. They weren't going to take on the dragoons. But as Parsons told Melbourne, the yeomanry have been dreadfully beaten. Reporting the Sherborne riot, the Dorset County Chronicle was very clear. The popular fury was beyond all control. Hang on a minute. On the evidence we've just seen, I would say it was not. The crowd we've just encountered was quite clearly disciplined, at least. It acted within self-imposed boundaries. Parsons' report to Lord Melbourne confirmed the strict selectivity of the attacks on property, the expensive damage done to windows, and the crowd's readiness to immediately correct any mistakes they might make. As though you break the wrong windows, this would sometimes happen in the dark and someone would shout out, no, he's a reformer. They go, he didn't vote for Ashley. And we're sorry, we'll pay for the damage and we move on to the next house. This happened not only there, but also in Yeovil. Rioters made no attempt to disguise themselves, and some were already well known and easily recognized by the authorities. Physical violence was minimal until, firstly, Parsons tried to make arrests of some of them, and secondly, they were attacked by the yeomanry, at which point they showed themselves more than ready to fight. And again, in contrast to swing crowds a year earlier who tended to disperse fairly fast when the yeomanry turned up. Now this pattern of window breaking, occasional escalation at certain houses, and a readiness to combat armed soldiers followed on very similar lines during riots elsewhere. At Bristol, at Bath, at Blandford, at Yeovil, at Worcester, 
At Blandford, where a makeshift barricade was drawn up to repel a dragoon sabre charge, the mayor advised Lord Melbourne it was so bad that the military were compelled to skirmish the mob and recourse was had to blank cartridges. The fighting was fierce too at Yeovil, where magistrates confirmed, quote, the very bad disposition of the lower orders and that the yeomanry had been obliged to open fire in the marketplace. They only used the flats of their swords, he reported, but they charged them several times in the streets. Barricade was also built across one of the entries at Worcester, behind which it was said many females had stationed themselves. They abused the soldiers and the fellows who fled before them as cowards. At Sherborne, <coughs> given the paucity of constables, active magistrates and regular soldiers, there was effectively very little to prevent the crowd from burning, looting and pillaging on a grand scale had they wanted to. But clearly the sole intention here was vengeance for a rigged election and a demand for reform. There was virtually no looting and the only house to be entered and ransacked was Parsons Vicarage. This was a very active and unpopular chief magistrate. Incidentally, later able to identify for prosecution five of the crowd who attacked him in the street because he and Edward West, the other clerical JP whose windows had been broken, had taken them up more than once before in the last five years, along with one or two other members of the same families and prosecuted them for the petty theft of foodstuffs. They were known, in, in other words, and picked out. Now, one of the standout fe central features in most of the reform riots that took place in the autumn of 1831 was window breaking. It became the primary objective of the crowd. What do we know about window breaking? Why might window breaking be worth knowing something about? The most serious outbreaks at Derby, at Nottingham and Bristol, of course, went a lot further than window breaking. But at Blandford, at Sherborne, at Yeovil, at Bath and at Worcester, crowds initially restricted themselves to shattering window panes and breaking the frames and fittings. Only rarely did they seek to gain access to the buildings they targeted, and where they did, it tended to be on a follow-up visit where they had been unopposed the first time, perhaps now with the intention of breaking furniture. So now there's an order of play, if you like. And in the case of several lawyers, at Blandford and Yeovil of going in and destroying their legal papers. Because at Bland Blandford and Yeovil, where the protest was partly about the, um, the by-election for Dorset, uh, lawyers were seen to be some, some of the biggest criminal culprits. One aim of Peel's police reforms in the 1820s was to rationalize the process for claiming damages, usually the replacement of shattered windows after a riot. This was the intention of the Malicious Injuries to Property Act, 1827. Now, under this legislation, full payment for riot damage might be claimed from the hundred in which it took place, that is, from local ratepayers, people who lived in the hundred, provided victims could establish rioters' intention not just to break some glass, but to demolish the building. Now, this was difficult to prove in itself, but it also laid rioters open to capital charges because demolishing or even intending to demolish a building was a felony under the act. If intention to demolish could not be proved, victims could still obtain a magistrate's order obliging the perpetrator to pay compensation, but only up to a maximum value of five pounds, rarely enough to pay for 365 pieces of expensive plate. Or, or less in most cases, but still never anything like enough. The difficulty faced by riot victims is well illustrated by an unfortunate Quaker named Corbin, whose windows had been broken during a pro-reform illumination in London in May. Told by magistrates at quarter sessions that he must establish intent to demolish if he wanted compensation from the hundred, Corbin said, as the London Courier reported it later, he said, it was impossible for him to say what were the intentions of the mob. He knew that they were riotous and tumultuous, but it was impossible for him to say that the mob had a felonious intent. Indeed, 
he believed they had not. And magistrates couldn't help him. Corbyn had to withdraw his claim. Now, some people were successful if they hired decent lawyers. At Bath in October, during the riots of October, a coaching inn was severely damaged and entered by a crowd trying to prevent the yeomanry from mustering and going to Bristol to put down the riots there. Once again, it's a solidarity riot. Very interesting. Don't see too many of those. Once again, a hefty claim for compensation from the hundred made it necessary for the inn's owners to press for the capital charge for beginning or intending to demolish the inn. They, and they levied that charge against three rioters. The judge realized this was a complicated case and he did his best to advise the jury. Now, he said, the beginning to demolish is open to various constructions. If boys going about the streets calling for an illumination throw stones at a window, that would not be beginning to demolish. But in this case, capital convictions were secured on rather vague evidence of intention, and the defendants ordered to, for transportation, so capitally convicted, uh, and compensation agreed of two hundred and thirty three pounds five shillings and five pence, not a fiver that's sixteen thousand pounds in pretty much in today's money at the hundreds expense wasn't popular with ratepayers. <clears throat> the law therefore placed rioters in a delicate legal situation, but one in which the breaking of windows alone was highly unlikely to land them in serious trouble if caught and prosecuted. I mean, if it was quite clear you hadn't any intention to pull the entire building down, or rather the prosecution couldn't prove that you'd had that intention. A an identificatory evidence given a crowd on the move and in the dark was not never very easy to secure anyway, so most window breakers would assume they would never find themselves in court. Of course, <laughs> we don't have any clear evidence that rioting crowds understood the political economy of window breaking sufficiently to strategize it in these terms. Stone throwers put before the bar, prosecuted for riotous behavior, have not unfortunately done historians the favor of declaring their strategic intentions. <laughs> um, nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, I put it to you, it remains a possibility and we should think about it. Why do people break windows? By April 1832, at least 259 prisoners had been hauled before a variety of courts on charges ranging from arson, demolition, and grand larceny to riot, assault, and petty theft. Seven were later hanged from Nottingham and Bristol. 43 were transported. Now, I'm not going to argue this was some it was a movement or even a meta movement, but it is worth adding these things together to see the impact, I think, that the, the 1831 riots had. And it's considerably less, of course, if we do the same thing with swing. You know, swing, I understand, as 1,976 criminal charges, 19 executions and 505 transportation orders uh, brought home against uh, rioters. But almost half of those swing cases were heard at one of five special commissions where central government was in a better position to direct proceedings. Melbourne and the Attorney General both called for some exemplary sentencing in 1831, but were disinclined unless it should prove absolutely necessary to order further special commissions. Legal redress was therefore left initially in the hands of local magistrates. Now, given that the national nationwide campaign to secure the bill was continuing to shape political argument both in and outside of parliament, there was very little appetite in some former riot centres for dragging out proceedings for any longer than necessary, or for dragging up memories of past riots in communities that had now become peaceful again. Consequently, in Mansfield, in Worcester, and in Derby, local authorities showed themselves keener to heal social wounds than to reopen them and committed their prisoners to the mercy of the borough sessions. Some of them summary courts, where light sentences were the only option on offer. In Loughborough, in Somerset, and in Dorset, prisoners stood trial either at the court of session or a size, drawing one more capital conviction for two Blandford rioters, but even this one was commuted, commuted to life transportation. At Derby, where prisons had after all been attacked, Suspects were eventually pushed on to take their trial at the Assize rather than the Borough Sessions. But the identificatory evidence being so thin, 
the majority of the charges, even at the Assize, were dropped and just two men transported for petty thefts. These were not the exemplary sentences Melbourne had in mind, nor will he have been happy with the Derby recorder's announcement that a legal distinction should be made between those with a consenting mind and those present through idle curiosity, contrary not only to the intention of the law, but to the expectations of the Home Office. Two special commissions were eventually fixed for Nottingham and for Bristol, where the scale of destruction had been the greatest. Opening the prosecution for, at Bristol, the Attorney General made government policy here very clear. Overhauling the leniency proposed at Derby, there, uh, there would be no mitigating distinction made between passive and active members of a crowd, he announced. No notice taken of ameliorating motive or intention. There would be no bystander. For even if they were present and never lifted a hand or uttered a word, they are all equally guilty, he said. This is the law. This must be the law in every civilized country, and it will be made awfully known in this city. And it was. 42 men and women were charged with simple theft or receiving stolen goods. 65 prisoners with breaking and entering, arson and demolishing, looting and aggravated riot. We think it necessary that some examples should be made for each of these crimes advised the Attorney General, and four death sentences were accordingly secured, a, pro a process that identified ringleaders for demolishing the jail, firing the mansion house, destroying private property in Queen Square, and most surprisingly, demagoguery, which you didn't know was a capital offense. The unfortunate demagogue was Christopher Davis, a lower middle class property owner, given to outspoken anti-establishment rhetoric and recognized by large numbers of witnesses at every stage in the riots over the three days. Although capitally convicted for destroying buildings, no evidence was produced that he had physically actually done so, only that he had repeatedly and loudly urged the crowd on and used inflammatory language against bishops, the corporation, and the prison system. In the words of prosecuting counsel, Davis was to be convicted for not assisting in preserving peace, nor watching to identify persons, nor in preserving property, but in encouraging rioters, not only by his presence, but by his language and his gestures. Indeed, it was particularly reprehensible, said the Attorney General, for, quote, a man of his station, possessing property, a father to a family, to be urging rioters on and cheering their accomplishments. Davis was left for execution as an example to his class, in a city whose middling orders had failed to do their duty in supporting the civil power. The execution of Christopher Davis takes us back to the concerns of some of the earliest historians of the riots, the acquiescence of the liberal middle classes in the destruction of the Ancien Regime, if you like, their refusal to turn out in its defense, or even in some cases here in particular, their active participation in making such clear social distinctions between an unaccountable and incompetent aristocratic order that was way past its sell-by date in one corner, a meritocratic middle class ascendancy in waiting in the middle, and a sprawling, unpredictable, debased mob in need of strict policing in the other corner. These rioters were quick to construct a brutalized, ignorant, non political criminal class as the architects of riot. Blurring the social boundaries as Davis had done was just unthinkable. And we might think, we might think that we no longer make judgments about rioters in these rash and simplistic terms. But it's social psychology that's far from dead and buried, as the analysis of our own political representatives proved in response to the English riots of August 
2011. These began, you will remember, with the police shooting of an unarmed man, Mark Duggan, in North in Tottenham, North London, and quickly spread to arson, to window breaking and property theft nationwide. Not everywhere, some places. How did these two upstanding individuals uh, understand what had happened? Here's Ken Clark. In my view, the riots can be seen in part as an outburst of outrageous behavior by the criminal classes. Criminal classes again. Individuals and families familiar with the justice system who haven't been changed by their paid past punishments. People with a former political uh, criminal record. A feral underclass cut off from the mainstream in everything but its materialism. Or MP Dave Cameron. <laughs> The whole country has been shocked by the most appalling scenes of people looting, violence, vandalizing, and thieving. It's criminality, pure and simple, and there is absolutely no excuse for it. There they are. <laughs> I'll leave it there. 